Welcome to the 10th anniversary celebration of the Center for Child and Family Policy here at Duke University. Um, I'm Ken Dodge, Center Director. I'd like to thank you uh, for coming today and being uh, a part of uh, the festivities. Um, the skies have opened up. The skies are indeed Carolina blue. We welcome all our friends from Chapel Hill. Thank you for coming. Absolutely. Um, I would like to, uh, before we get going, I'd like to acknowledge um, a couple of the uh, people who are responsible uh, for today. Um, first, uh, um, quickly, but very importantly, I want to thank Barbara Pollock and Erica Laco for making today happen. <laughs> they have uh, been with the center for a long time. Barbara was the very first person uh, that I hired um, even before I got here, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Also want to acknowledge a couple of people who might be here, I'm not sure, but uh, have been part of the inspiration for the center. Joel Fleischman, this is Fleischman Commons we are sitting in now, and Joel Fleischman was the inspiration uh, through Terry Sanford for the Sanford Institute of Public Policy, and I'm really indebted to him, and, and we all are. Um, I also wish to acknowledge and thank uh, the directors of the Sanford Institute, which is now the Sanford School of Public Policy, in which we are sitting, um, Phil Cook, was director 10 years ago, um, and then Bruce Gentleson, and now Bruce Conahome. All three have been terrific leaders, and I'm very uh, grateful to them. Um, there are many other people uh, that could be acknowledged, and I have been trying to acknowledge a number of people all day long. Those that I have acknowledged the least are those from within our own staff. You know who you are. Thank you very much. Um, before um, you get to meet Jim Heckman, I get the honor of introducing Bill Chafe, who will introduce our speaker. And I wanted to do this. Um, William H. Chafe is the uh, Ari Alice Mary Baldwin Professor of History at Duke. Uh, Bill Chafe's life has been marked by his sense that the university should contribute solutions to society's challenges. I first heard of Bill Chafe when I was a graduate student here at Duke in the 70s. I didn't get to meet him then, but heard about him. What a legacy. And in his own prize-winning research, he has addressed historical challenges of race and gender equality in the American South. I first got to meet Bill Chafe in 1989 when our paths crossed at Stanford on the West Coast, and now I'm very lucky to call him my friend. Uh, Bill was the dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Duke University in 1999 who had a vision for the Center for Child and Family Policy that led to its creation. He had an unwavering faith that the Duke University community of faculty members, staff, and students could contribute solutions to problems facing children, families, and educators if only we put our minds to the task and devoted resources where necessary. I'm very grateful to Dean Chafe for his vision faith and friendship, and I am just thrilled to be able to introduce him to you. Thanks, Ken. I want to make a couple of remarks, but before that, Phil Costanzo wants to finish some remarks that he was in the process of making. Thank you, Phil. Uh, be before I introduce Professor Heckman, I just want to say a couple of words. Uh, it is true that I think all of us have opportunities at different points in our lives to try to make some difference in the institutions we work for. I tried to do that as dean, but there was nothing that ever reached the point of having a greater impact than the chance that came to me in 1999 to appoint 
uh, Ken Dodge uh, as uh, director of the Child and Family Policy uh, Center at Duke. It was an extraordinary opportunity. I knew Ken from Stanford. We'd worked together at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. I knew this would make a critical difference in our university. And of the many, many moments of my deanship that were times of exaltation, this was one of the best. And I just want to say how important it is to have been here with you all these years and all you've done to make this a much better place. <clears throat> Now, I have the great honor of introducing our speaker today. Uh, James Heckman is the Henry Schultz Distinguished Service Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago, uh, where he has served since the 1970s. Uh, in the 2000, he shared the Riksbank Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel uh, with Daniel McFadden. He directs uh, the Economics Research Center and the Center for Social Program Evaluation at the Harris School for Public Policy. And he also teaches at the University of Dublin, which is a wonderful thing to be able to do as an alternative to being in Chicago. I think it's marvelous. And he's also a research fellow with the American uh, Bar Foundation. His work has been devoted to marrying scientific methods uh, with economic policy evaluation. And he has focused especially on models of how to measure problems and possibilities created by heterogeneity, diversity on people's lives, like their life experience, their economic experience. Um, this merging of scientific evaluation uh, and social policy is most re evident uh, in some of the pioneering research he has done on outcomes of people who have obtained uh, the high school equivalency uh, diploma, uh, which has made, made a tremendous impact, as well as for his incredible work on the importance and, and saliency of early childhood education programs uh, on the futures, future lives of individuals. Uh, his research has given important policymakers important new insights into how they should proceed with the best kind of scientifically verifiable information. Uh, Professor Heckman has published over 200 articles and several books. His most recent books include Inequality in America, What Role for Human Capital Policy, written with Alan Kruger, and Evaluating Human Capital Policy and Law and Employment, Lessons from Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, he has deeply invested himself already in his two days here at Duke. Uh, he spent uh, three hours yesterday with uh, Barbara French talking about the East Durham Ch uh, Childhood Initiative, uh, and we, I, we know that is going to be very productive. And when I came in here, he was spending an hour, I think, with Governor James Hunt explaining the nuances of all the things that uh, he was pre he, he's going to be presenting here today. Uh, he has received numerous awards uh, for his work, uh, including the John Bates Clark Award of the American Economic Association in, in 1983, uh, the 2005 and 2007 Dennis Agner Award for Applied Econ Econ Econometrics from the Journal of Econometrics, the 2007 Theodore W. Schultz Award from the American Agricultural Economics Association, and the 2005 Jacob Mincer Award for Lifetime Achievement in Labor Economics. Clearly, we have someone who has an enormous amount to tell us, and we look forward to hearing his remarks. Professor Ackman. Thank you very much for those kind words, and uh, I'm, I'm really very pleased to be here to speak on the 10th anniversary. I didn't realize the full significance uh, that, uh, that you were fully 10 years old. I guess I should have read the letter more closely, but I didn't. <laughs> but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good occasion, and it's one that I found extremely useful. Uh, it's a chance to meet old friends like Joe Hutz and Duncan Thomas and many others in this room. I don't want to single just them out, uh, Honey Lad and others. Uh, as well as new collaborations that we've had here with the with the, with the group, I guess across the way, the the, the ones the boys are the girls in blue, from uh, North Carolina, uh, Franklin Porter Graham Center, and uh, it is uh, a, a very interesting uh, uh, two days that I've spent here, and I hope I'm invited back because we have a lot of interest. You know, Ken and I spent some time in Chicago last uh, December, and. I uh, look forward to further interactions with him on this very same kind of question I'm talking about now. Let me see if I can get it going. So what I'm going to talk about today is the economics of investing in children. And I actually gave a private tutorial to your former governor a few minutes ago. And I actually told him, I, he asked me if there's anything that I would have said differently uh, had, he, had I been in his shoes, and I said yes, there was, and that he had actually forgotten half of what this talk is all about, which is non-cognitive skills. And so I want to try to shape what a case is and sort of why this, these, these topics that we're discussing uh, in, in, in these seminars today and discussions are so important and to think slightly differently about policy towards uh, inequality and disadvantage. And some of what I'm going to say repeats or maybe 
re restates some of what we heard in the very interesting panel uh, earlier today. But I think the repetition may be of some use, especially for those who weren't here. So let me make a statement which I think is so well known that it's uh, almost uh, uh, a bromide. If people know that this is true, American society, the graphs that were handed out uh, by Ron Haskins certainly demonstrated this. American society is becoming polarized. And another dimension that he didn't feature was essentially less productive. The U.S. productivity rate, especially labor productivity, has been in decline for some time. It picked up, it's picked up over some episodes, you know, in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s. But generally speaking, labor productivity is a serious issue. And so let me just give you a few facts. Uh, I think some of you have a sheet where some of these facts are there, but let me just lay out the sheets. I, I, have a, I am an academic economist. I'm not a former governor. I would never be elected a governor of anything, I promise you. Uh, but uh, but I, I, and so I'm, I'm less politically sensitive maybe than others in the room, but I still think it's useful to kind of look at the structure of these policies, of these problems, and what American society has. Uh, experienced and what I think is a refined way, a new way to think about public policy. So the polarization is something that's real. A lot of books are written about it, articles. People have noted this. Uh, one dimension of uh, this polarization is that at the same time we have a greater percentage of all of our children graduating, uh, uh, attending and graduating college than ever in our past. So the college graduation rate is actually uh, picking up in the last uh, few years. At the same time, if you properly measure it, there's a greater percentage of people dropping out of secondary school. Uh, and therefore, what we have is a polarization of the American society. Now, the official statistics actually mask that. We have something called the GD, which is already mentioned by, the, by Dean Chafe. And the, uh, uh, the GD graduates about 12% uh, of all of our high school graduates, about 12%. In some states, it's as high as 20%. GDs are actually performing at the rate of high school dropouts. So I think it's the only accurate calculation is GDs are dropouts. And if you count GDs as dropouts, we have a growing dropout population, not just stagnant, but growing. And this point, this fact was alluded to earlier, I'll just repeat it, but it's a study that has attracted a lot of attention. That if you look at the recruiting records and you look at American youth who apply to get in the military, about 75% are ineligible, either because of criminal records, obesity, or low cognitive capacities. They can't pass a test. And so this means then, by this measure, now this isn't a full inventory of American society, but it is an inventory that we, we really are finding that a lot of American youth are not living up to a minimal level of standard. We also have measured from the U.S. adult literacy surveys that about 20% of the workforce has a very low literacy rate. So low that if you actually gave them a vial of pills and said, you know, take one a day or something kind of slightly complicated, they wouldn't fully understand it. So it's a very low level of workplace productivity. And we've seen from a number of studies, work by DeLong and, uh, and Katz and Golden and others, uh, that there's been a slowdown in the growth of skills in the workforce. And so we know that this has itself real consequences for workforce productivity and the performance of the American economy in the future. Now, all these problems are familiar. A lot of people discuss these problems, and I'm not telling you anything you haven't heard, or maybe a few facts you haven't, but the main thrust is there. But the way that we analyze these problems is, is, is in isolation of each other. These problems are typically treated in a piecemeal fashion. So there are a lot of lobbies, really, intellectual lobbies, groups of people who will blame one institution or another, or look for one sort of source of solution over another. So a lot of people will blame the public schools. Uh, a lot of people talk about high tuition costs. So a lot of people, we know tuition costs have gone up. And most economists, all the economists in the room would certainly recognize that when you raise the price of a good, you typically buy less of it. And that's true for college as well as other goods. But if you ask where the gaps in college going have appeared, and I'll show you some statistics on that, what you'll find is, in fact, that these factors are not playing the major role. And so we really have to more than just take a list of these items, we have to really prioritize and understand that the public schools, I don't think, are the main problem, although they certainly can be made better. <laughs> Rising tuition costs are certainly a contributing factor, but they're not the main problem. And I think it's important for us to understand what these competing proposals have been and to try to put them in a firm ground. So today I want to lay out a framework that allows us to sort of integrate our bodies of knowledge in economics and psychology and epidemiology and neuroscience that puts us in a common framework for thinking about these problems. 
So this is uh, what I want to do today. And I want to argue that there is a strong economic case. All of these cases are provisional. Any empirical, serious empirical person will never say they know the truth. They'll just say, I know it as of today. This is the, my best call. And I have to say, I've tried my best. And, and you lay out the case for that. So th this, this is no different from any of those cases. But I think the arguments are strong. And I'll try to show you what they are. So this is the argument. Let me make a few. And this is in the handout, if you happen to have it, this, this argument. So what I want to argue is that many major economic and social problems, like, like crime, teenage pregnancy, even obesity, high school dropout rates, adverse health conditions, can be traced to low levels of skill and ability. Skill and ability are really important factors. Now, that by itself doesn't say too much. But I want to try to argue that, that these factors are very important. I don't want to minimize any of the other incentive effects. So if we don't have police on the street, if we don't have, crime is going to occur. So none of this is saying, but when we have in a standardized incentive environment, these early factors play a very important role. But now this is the part where I was quarreling with your former governor. Because when we think about ability, we need to recognize the multiple aspects of ability. So much of our discussion uh, is focusing on the question of cognitive ability. So we know, for example, in the No Child Left Behind, uh, emphasis in the Bush administration and in much of the way we think about whether our schools are succeeding or not, even the way we think about the achievement gap is typically in terms of a cognitive test. And we know that cognitive abilities are very important. There are lots and lots of studies that show cognitive abilities are important. But we've also learned something else and this is something that doesn't receive as much attention as it should. And it's something that actually is extraordinarily important if we really are to think about what good policies will be. So if we look, for example, at other dimensions of human performance, we would look at social and emotional skills, physical and mental health. We would look at things like perseverance, attention, motivation, and self-confidence. I was telling the governor the story about, uh, you know, you little kids, you know, you're about a little train that could, a little engine that could, you know, I think I can, I think I can. We, we read those to our kids. We know they're important. Uh, Thomas Edison uh, made the remark that genius was right, 1% uh, inspiration and 99% perspiration. That's a statement about the importance of non-cognitive skills. You'll find this in Aesop's fables, tortoise and the hare, and so forth. So it's all around. And yet in our public policy, we typically are focusing only on these cognitive skills as measured by a test. Now, there are two things wrong with that. First of all, achievement on a test is partly related to non-cognitive skills. So your ability, your desire to actually succeed, your motivation, and your non-cognitive traits play a very important role, even on the getting the very test score. But to the extent that the test score is just capturing kind of some aspect of the human behavior, I want to try to convince you it's missing a big part of the story. And the reason why that's interesting is because we can do, we can first of all measure these skills. Sometimes in public policy discourse, these are called soft skills, skills that can't be measured. But there's a lot of work that's been done recently on trying to make those soft skills hard. There's a group of economists and psychologists that have come together not the, behavior, not the behavioral economists working with the cognitive psychologists so much as other economists working with personality psychologists and the like, and showing the importance of these skills and also showing that they can be manipulated. And they can be manipulated, they can be, they can be altered in favorable directions in ways that I don't think we even fully understood 10 years ago. And I want to show you that some of the case for early childhood that we think of as, as being mostly focused as, as teaching little kids, you know, maybe baby Einsteins or creating kind of more verbal uh, skills at age three so they'll be smart at seven, that a large part, not all, but a, part, a substantial part of what these early programs are doing is basically creating uh, non-cognitive skills, social and emotional skills. And in fact, I want to show you a few slides on the Perry Preschool program showing much of its effect is mediated through its consequence on non-cognitive traits. These non so the understanding how soft skills are really quite hard in the sense they have predictive power and that the evidence is not just correlational evidence but some causal evidence actually helps us understand much better and that, the, uh, that we need to understand that, that another component of ability is cognitive and is cognitive ability as we thought about for a long time but also non-cognitive ability. So that's part of the argument. Another part of the argument is something that longitudinal data sets have given us a lot of information about. And that is the ability gaps between the haves and the have-nots, the advantage and the disadvantage, open up. And that's, they open up very early in life. 
And these are gaps that actually are associated with, uh, 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 with both cognitive abilities and non-cognitive abilities. Now, that's important, and I'm going to show you some evidence on that. But we also want to argue that these abilities are produced. One of the common themes in public policy discussions is somehow that these traits, cognitive and non-cognitive, are more or less genetically given. They're God-given gifts. And what we've come to understand is how the environment does affect the expression of these gifts. How, in fact, even things that are genetically determined are moderated by the effects of the environment on those. And the reason why that's so important is that when we look at family environments, and this was already alluded to earlier about Senator Moynihan's, uh, uh, or, or, or I guess at that time Assistant Secretary Moynihan's uh, fears about the family, the black family in particular, materialized for the whole society, that in fact we do have serious issues with what the quality is of environments of early children. So these environments matter, and this is a source of great concern because the environments in some sense are getting worse, much worse. And so, more than genetics is at work, the family plays a powerful role, and yet family conditions are not doing so well in many dimensions. It depends on how you measure family, the quality of family life, and I'll try to, try to discuss that. Now, how do I know that it's not just genetics? Well, the reason why it's not just genetics is we have a lot of experimental interventions, some very distinguished interventions here, Francis Campbell and her group uh, in the Abyssidarian Project, at the Franklin Porter Graham Center, as well as work at Perry and other studies as well, have shown by experimental manipulation that early interventions can make a difference. At least in the study, in the group that I've studied the most, the Perry children, the lion's share of those treatment effects that come out of the program, the lion's share of the high rate of return to that are being mediated by increases in uh, non-cognitive skills. And so what we've learned then is that these traits, which we used to think of as being fixed in stone, I mean, William James, the famous psychologist, once said that, plaster, that, the, that the personality traits of an individual were more or less set like plaster early in life and would never change. That's simply wrong. It's also equally wrong to say the personality traits are completely malleable, so you are what you need to be in every situation. That's the kind of uh, Woody Allen, Zelig version of the human personality. So the truth is somewhere in between, but it's important when we look at this policy that we understand, these policies that we understand the power of these non-cognitive traits. So society intervenes early enough. It can raise both cognitive and social emotional abilities and even health. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on health. And a lot of evidence shows how they reduce inequality by promoting schooling, reducing crime, reducing teenage pregnancy, and fostering workforce productivity. And in reanalyses and analyses of the benefit-cost ratios, where we actually go and test and kick the tires on these, we find that the rates of return on these programs, especially the Perry program, where the, the data are out the longest, the kids are 40 years old now, we can actually get rates of return that are above the return historically on equity. So we basically, in terms of investing in people early on versus investing in the stock market, say between 1945 and 2008, you'd get a higher return in persons rather than in the stocks. So what we also need to understand, and this is the question of prioritization, in some of the discussions I've heard today, they're well-meaning discussions, but I'm an economist after all, and I need, and in a time of tight budgets, we have to be really hard-nosed. We really have to understand that if we have a limited budget, we need to spend our money where it has the highest rate of return. I wish this principle had actually been applied more in the last year in the stimulus package, because, you know, I, there have been, actually, Orzag computed the rate of return to pothole uh, uh, replacement. It's, there is a positive return, but it's a lot less than the return to the Perry Preschool program. And if you go down the line in a number of intervention programs, for example, reduced pupil-teacher ratios. These are things that receive so much attention. David Card and Alan Kruger uh, had, did a series of studies that showed that if you have smaller classroom size, you pay higher teacher salaries, you will find that this has an effect in terms of increased earnings for the individuals. However, when you do a cost-benefit analysis and say, what if you hire the teachers to get the reduced classroom size? What is the cost of actually doing this? You get a negative rate of return for those same interventions. So again, we have to prioritize. Joe and I, Joe Hudson and I did some, a lot of work on the job training program some 20 years ago, the ones that President Clinton killed finally. And basically, the rate of return there was either zero, in some cases, negative. So when we go down this list and we think about this large body of programs that are out there, they're all viewed as competing programs, what we find, and I'll show you a little bit of evidence, that things like adult literacy, 
convict rehabilitation, uh, and, and some, a lot of the programs that were funded uh, last year uh, under the ARA was, were, are, have much lower rates of return than the kind of programs we're talking about today. But it's that kind of discipline that needs to be made. It's not just saying we want to do good things and we, we can qualitatively uh, say that we want to do all these good things. We want to actually quantitatively assess how far we can go, how far we should go. Now, the reason why these early programs have an effect is that we know that life cycle skill formation is dynamic in nature. There really is a self-reproducing, a self-productive notion here. Skill begets skill, motivation beget motivation, and they cross-foster each other. And we know, and this is something that I'll show you a little bit of evidence on, that if we wait too late in the life cycle, it's not that it's impossible to remediate, it's just much more costly. So it's always a question of, so I was being, I guess you were attributing to me the notion that you should invest only in the early years. That's insane. I mean, obviously you don't want to invest only in the first three years and then lock the kid up in a closet and then send him off to the workplace. I understand, but no, not, I understand. But there is a sense in which the prioritization would actually be a sort of moving more investments towards the early years than we currently do, especially for disadvantaged children. Because really, I'm talking a lot about disadvantaged children. And I will contradict one of your points, too, later on, which is about targeting. But I, I, will, I still will accommodate it. So what we've come to understand, though, and I want you to show you, is that the longer society waits, the more costly it is. And for some of these interventions, we really haven't found ex successful ways. So if you get a kid who's got, you know, he's, a, he's an 18-year-old illiterate, say, with a prison record, so far, the track record is pretty poor. There may be a few exceptions about average effects for groups of individuals. Most of the interventions have been very ineffective. But now, that's not to say we can't do better, and we shouldn't try to do better. That's, nothing is saying that at all. But it is saying that what we know now suggests that's not a very useful way. So what we need to do is rethink our public policy to understand, to understand to incorporate the life cycle of skill and health formation and the importance of the early years. So that's what I want to talk about today. So let me give you some evidence on this. And I, I am a victim of being, of liking too many slides. I am an academic after all, I'm not a governor, so I, uh, I like my slides. Uh, but let me show you a few facts. And um, not to malign the governor, I have a great respect for your former governor, he's a great. Uh, but here's a, here's a piece of fact information that got me onto this subject in the first place. This is some work I did some years ago now, nine years ago, published with Yona Rubinstein and Jing Jing Si at the University of Chicago. And what we were doing was we were looking at GDs. And uh, GDs are these same groups of people I mentioned who uh, are now about 12% of all high school graduates, 12 to 14%. And I was really curious about the GDs uh, because I, I learned about them actually in the course of looking at job training programs. There's a lot of GDs, a lot of job, job tour used to mainly produce GDs. And so it turned out that the GDs are earning at the rate of high school dropouts. And that's a fact. If you look at the GDs, they're earning at the rate of high school dropouts. But there's a test. And the test was this GED test that certified that they're the equivalents of high school graduates. So what we did is we looked at. This is for white males, for white females. It's true for all the other demographic groups. So I just choose two not to bombard you. So if you look at this, is just the baseline distributions. This is the distribution of the test scores for white males and white females. My purpose here isn't to make a comparison across the groups. It's to compare with, in each group, where the GDs lie. So if I say, where do the graphs of the test scores of the GDs lie relative to the ordinary high school graduates who complete seat time, they do equally well. The GDs are as smart, at least as measured by this test. The test does its job, because the test is looking, basically, for people to, uh, who are, are successful in uh, in, 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 uh, in, in passing a test. But now, if we ask what do we get in terms of earnings, the rate of return on the GED is about the same as the rate of being a high school dropout. So the GEDs are as smart as high school graduates. They complete, who complete education by class time, but they lack non-cognitive skills. And how do we know that? Because when we look at a variety of dimensions of their lives later on, the GEDs are not only the people who drop out of high school, they're also the people who drop out of the military if they get into the military. They're also the people who drop out of marriages if they get into marriages. They, they drop out of a, a variety of workplace situations, almost every environment. They lack social skills. And in some recent work, we actually quantified those social skills and found that it, we can literally find that the GEDs have the same level of cognitive skills, but by the new measures of non-cognitive skills, they're very low in those dimensions. 
So that's, another, that's an evidence that, that here, here was the first piece of evidence that I found. What was interesting is that the GEDs, the military got onto this a long time ago, and in fact the Marines refused to take GEDs because they're too violent and undisciplined. You know, you have to be, vi you have to be disciplined in your violence if you're in the Marine Corps, and the, and the, and the GEDs lack that. They just literally couldn't, they couldn't finish, the, they couldn't do anything. So let me show you some evidence that I have, some papers with Jorah Steeksrud and uh, Sergio Itsua. And we looked at some of the same factors that motivated a lot of attention and still receive a lot of attention. The effects, say, of cognition. Hernstein, the famous psychologist years ago, looked at this relationship between crime, Hernstein and Wilson, between crime and IQ. And he's noticed this very strong relationship, a negative relationship that, uh, that the higher the IQ, the lower the level of crime. And this, this graph reproduces that relationship. What you find is you go from the bottom of the distribution which is low skills in terms of cognition to the top, what you find is the people at the, uh, at the top are much less likely to be in jail at age 30. So that's the cognitive. If you ask the question, what about non-cognitive skills, you get in this sense of asking if you, where is the movement from the bottom of the distribution to the top, you actually find a similar or even more dramatic drop-off. So you find that higher levels of non-cognitive skills, I would even argue this is a causal relationship, but certainly correlationally are associated with much lower levels of crime. And we can do the same thing for a lot of other dimensions of performance. Here's the relationship between teenage pregnancy and cognition. You see very high levels uh, of uh, teenage pregnancy for the low ability girls, and then you go to the top of the distribution, very low level, that's in terms of high cognitive skills. In non-cognitive skills, the two distributions almost overlap. If you ask, as we've been talking about, looking at the dimension of four-year college graduates, we can ask, again, holding constant one factor, moving the other, as you go from the bottom of the distribution, which is on the left side of each figure, to the top, you find much higher levels of who goes to college. So if you ask somebody who has a very low level of cognitive and non-cognitive skills, say measured at age 9 and age 10, who's going to actually graduate four-year college? You're going to get very high level of predictability. Uh, when, and, and even after you include things like family income, tuition, and all that, it's really much, uh, these, are, these are powerful factors. So I will, uh, I will yeah, so, so let me give you one factor though that's very important. Many people are concerned about the achievement gap. It's something that's disturbing about American society. What we found, this is uh, work I did with Steve Cameron again some 10 years ago or so, is that once we control for ability measured at the high school going age, it's a fact that US minorities are more likely to attend college, more likely despite having lower family incomes and beside other measures of adversity. They're more likely. And so what we find that is that the factors that are leading to this are not high levels of tuition. It's not necessarily family income. We're not talking about attending Duke. We're talking about attending any college. So this is community colleges and so forth. And so let me just give you an idea. I'll just show you one graph here. This is, let me show you just the bottom, which is, I mean, these are all three uh, relevant, but I don't want to beat you to death with too many statistics, so let me see if I can use the mouse. Can this, yeah, this shows up. That's good. So if you look at this bottom two figures here, what you can actually see is that the gap, this is taken around 2000, the gap between whites and minorities in terms of college going, college entry now, this is all levels of college, it's two-year and four-year schools, was 12% favoring whites. And if you look at the Hispanic gap, it was even bigger, 14 percentage points. If you adjust for those abilities, cognitive and non-cognitive, at age 17, you can actually reverse the gap. You're saying once you standardize the ability, you're finding that that gap is uh, actually minus 16. So in that sense, blacks are more likely to be going to college, and Hispanics are more likely to be going to college. It's partly a matter of affirmative action and other issues, but it's still the case. And the other factors play a... And so what we found was interesting, that the gaps in the abilities that play such an important role are actually... Uh, these, 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 these factors, and that these factors open up at early ages. These gaps in the haves and the have-nots open up. So we found that the, the schools, the schools receive so much attention about the quality of the school affecting uh, the, the scores and so forth. We found that uh, schooling, even though it varies a lot in the United States, high quality or low quality schools, the schooling quality plays very little uh, role in, in accounting for these gaps and that most of the measures of teacher quality that we least use, I'm not saying the teachers don't matter, but the conventional measures, pupil-teacher ratio, teacher salaries, have a very minor effect. So let me just show you one graph 
And this is a graph uh, taken from a study that I'm doing with Greg Duncan and Brooks Gunn and some other people. This is basic, let me just put the whole graph out here because what it shows is the cognitive score. This is just a measure of cognition. Uh, by classified by the mother's uh, uh, educational level. So the top graph would be associated with college educated women. The bottom line would actually be associated with the uh, high school dropout mothers. Big gaps at age 18. But the most important thing about this graph is that the gaps that are there at 18 are already pretty much there at age five and, and, and even to a considerable degree at age three, long before these kids even enter school. Okay, so that's an important factor. And there are hundreds of graphs like this. I mean, in this book that was mentioned with Kruger, uh, Pedro Carnero and I actually spent a lot of time uh, going through this. And there's a lot of independent verification by many other scholars. So this, this finding is not unique to me. And if we do a similar kind of accounting in terms of social and emotional skills, this is just one index. And it's not the same age range. This is now between age four and age 12. But still, it shows a similar pattern. This is a problem of behavioral problems. So this is a behavioral problem index. And if you look at the kids from the lowest income classes, they now score high. They have a lot of behavioral problems. Those at the bottom are those at the bottom of this graph are those from the more advantaged family. And you'll notice again, those gaps at age 12 are already there at age four, or mostly there at age four. There's some role, but those gaps are there. Those early years are really important. And there's also some similar findings, although not the parallelism. There's some work by Case, Lubotsky, and Passan showing if in a measure of health disparities, if you go from exactly individuals who go from, here's a scale where one to five, the higher the score, the worse the health. There are real disparities that open up and they continue opening up across age. Disparities across income level and then by income level, they're actually widening with age. So these gaps emerge. But now when you look at graphs like that, there are immediate questions that come to mind. If, if Charles Murray were here, he would immediately say, of course, because that's the genetic predisposition. So the evidence leaves open a lot of questions. And this is the kind of research that we're doing, and a lot of people in this room are doing, to try to understand what produces this. So the first explanation is genetics. You see, so smart kids are born to smart parents. So you're just seeing a reproduction of a genetic process. Or is it due to family environments? Is it really due to the fact that families are doing better? Or more than just environments, really active roles by families, not just that the mother's smart and that kind of spreads an environment, but also that they take the kid to the zoo, they read to the kid, and stuff. Well, there's a lot of research that's looked into that, and it's still going on. Some of the people in the room are actively contributing to that research, and I probably shouldn't mention names. I will by attribution here the, in some of these graphs. But this is the kind of question. So the evidence is that from the intervention studies, which are extremely valuable, that we can actually manipulate family environments. And we can look at environments not only for humans, but we can look at it for rats, and we can look at it for monkeys. And I'll show you some evidence on both. Because with monkeys, we can do a lot of things we can't do with people. And in many ways, we can actually get a, a firmer understanding through experimental manipulations that are basically illegal for uh, human beings. Um, but, but nonetheless, the, uh, uh, so then the question then becomes, what do we know? So let me, let me just give you one dark fact, which is, I think, uh, it's actually quite dark in this uh, screen here. So uh, I don't know if you can see it. And this is kind of reinforces the point. So we talked about the Moynihan issue. So family environments will matter. And let me just tell you why that should be a great source of concern. Because really what we're talking about today is family policy. People like to talk about early childhood because they don't want to get anywhere near the issue about families. But if you look, for example, at the single biggest growth sector in American families, what you'll see is that the percent of kids under 18 living with one parent uh, who where they've actually never seen, the, the, the mother's never been married and the father's really absent in a fundamental sense, that's been the biggest growth. That's the growth trend up there. So if you look at the overall statistics for the U.S. population, it's around 28, 29 percent. But the biggest single growth sector has been in this never married category. So the family is substantially different than what it was even 40 years ago. Uh, the, 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 the divorced, you know, the percentage of kids raised in divorced families, that's been fairly constant actually over the last few years. Now why is that important? And this is work of Seung Moon who happens to be here in the, uh, in the audience. Um, and, 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 and in fact, we have measurements from a lot of data sources. I'm only giving you a small snapshot of a large literature. Each one of these has, is like an iceberg, the tip of an iceberg. There are lots of things there to support it. 
But for example, if you look by family type, single mother, broken, intact, one of the crudest categories we can come up with, if we look at measures of cognitive stimulation, what we see is these figures on the right, the ones, the blue figure, that what we find is the intact families are spending a great deal more time with cognitive stimulation, reading to the child, promoting learning, and so forth. And this has been very well documented. Uh, and it, the patterns continue over the life cycle of the child. So what we've also come to understand then is that a major source of inequality in the American society is the quality of the American environments. And I'll, let me just show you some figures. It may not be pleasant news, but I'll just show you again from Seung Moon's work. And this is basically looking at a graph of how resources are distributed differentially across different ethnic groups. So we're looking at Hispanics and we're looking at African American populations. Now, the way to read these graphs would be the following. I'm putting the Hispanic and black distributions in the, in the white distribution. If things were equally distributed, you get a straight line across that would be uh, roughly at, at 0.10%. These are deciles of the distribution. What this shows is that blacks and Hispanic families are way overrepresented in the low end of the material goods distribution. And if we look at other measures, for example, and so you say, well, that's family income. But look at measures of cognitive stimulation. Again, a massive overrepresentation. And so what we're finding for emotional support, so developmental factors that we know to be important. And even when we make adjustments for things like family income and the long run scale, and we look at things like, uh, like mother's education, we still find substantial gaps. And that's important because I want to show you that these factors are playing a very important role in explaining child outcomes. So this early deprivation is there, and it's the real measure of poverty. See, this, this is something that's emerged from these studies. When we think about poverty, the traditional role, I saw the picture of Lyndon Johnson as I walked in. You think of the war on poverty 40 years ago, and Molly Orshansky and this whole literature about how to measure poverty. Well, if you want to measure poverty for young children, it's not going to be just family income. It's going to be these resources like emotional support, parenting, because those are the factors that matter the most. And that's actually the correct way to do so. And if we do that, we get a much richer notion of what poverty really is all about. It's not just family income. There can be some very rich families that apparently give poor emotional support. My favorite example is Paris Hilton, actually, yeah. <laughs> as, as an example. But I mean, there are other, other examples as well. So let, let me talk about another line of work, though, which we've come to understand. And this is where the neuroscience comes in. And I think it's interesting. And I don't want to go into this, because there's always a danger uh, of flirtation with areas you don't really know and so forth, but actually I've gotten some experience in this. The genetic argument is always there on the table. It's been on the table and always will be on the table. And it, it, 100 years ago in the era of social Darwinism, that was the argument, right? That we really did have reproduction. People didn't really understand genetics like we do now, but there was this argument that there was the people born dumb and there were these social classes and they reflected a certain wisdom and, and the, the, the aristocracy was smart and the, the, the poor were not. What we've come to understand in the last 30 years is from genetics now and from, uh, and from hard biology is how experience gets embodied in the biology of the organism. And we understand how poverty actually operates, how these low levels of family skills actually operate. And what it does is it actually affects the way the gene affects you. So we know a lot more about genetics than we did 100 years ago. We had discovered DNA. We have all these processes. One of the most interesting features about genes, of course, is the genes themselves do nothing. They have to be expressed. And the expression of the DNA or the lack of expression can lead to powerful differences in individuals. So two individuals can have exactly the same genetic traits, but they literally will have a differentially methylated gene, how the gene expresses itself, and how that gene is making the protein that makes the behavior that we think is associated with genetic behavior. So let me just give you a little bit of evidence on this, because it's a deeper understanding of how the early years play a role. And here I'll bring in some rats, just because I can't resist it, but it's, it's actually quite in rats and some monkeys. So the point is, is that experience gets under the skin in a literal way modifying DNA. So let me show you. I don't know if these graphs are that helpful. They're a little too small. I didn't notice that till this morning, but here it is. What this is, is it shows the DNA. It's, it's actually the patterns of the methylation of the DNA in identical twins. These are people who have literally the same DNA. They literally share the same genetic material. Now, the, as I said, the genetic material is expressing itself, though, only through this methylation. So methylation can, can either can suppress 
or accentuate the, the expression of the genetic material. So if you look at these uh, three-year-olds, there's a twin. So this one twin is on the left, the other twin's on the right. If, in fact, the, the expressed DNA was the same for the, in these two groups, the coloration pattern should be identical. And what you, all I really want you to see, and I'm, I'm not trying to obscure this, it got a little too small, but it's a paper published in the Proceedings of the National Academy, and you can see that they are really different. The coloration patterns are there. You get to 50-year-old twins, identical twins, they're dramatically different. And so the methylation, literally the experience getting under the skin, is affecting the behavior. And it's affecting the things that generate the behaviors. What we've come to understand also is that early environments play a very powerful role. So the, although the genetic argument's on the table, the genetic argument is not all powerful. So there was a finding, I won't show you that finding, but there was a finding that Wilson actually featured many years ago. And that is there's a certain gene, or a certain short allele of the gene. The name isn't so important. But that gene was much highly correlated with criminal behavior. So if you went to the state penitentiary, you'd find an excess abundance of this gene compared to others. Now, what we found recently, what I didn't find it, but what was found recently, was in fact that the expression of that gene only took power, only had predictive power, if that genetic configuration was put into an adverse environment. So if you had kids who were born and raised in ordinary middle-class environments, Having that gene was not at all predictive of criminal behavior. On the other hand, criminal and aggressive behavior. So the environments matter. Let me just show you one, one example. And this is a medical example, actually. So, and this is turning the corners around, but it's showing the gene-environment interactions that are so important. So the recent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy by Danis, and he shows that maltreated children are much more likely in adult lives to have inflammation. So a, a process that leads you, makes them much more likely to you know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a condition that makes you much more susceptible to disease and, and a number of diseases. And uh, so there was a serious difference between the maltreated and the non-maltreated. But then what he found what it was mediated through a genetic mediator. So it wasn't all maltreated. This doesn't endorse maltreatment, by the way. <laughs> but it does suggest, though, that effectively that when we came to understand these early genetic associations that were the stuff of pop science 20 years ago, that a lot of it just missed the point that it's a gene-environment interaction. There's a rich field of epigenetic interaction. This is a study done by Francis Champagne, who's a uh, psychologist at the University of, uh, at Columbia University. She worked with some scho leading scholars in, um, in Montreal, but she's a leading scholar in her own right. She's looking at rats, and it turns out there's a maternal uh, pattern, which is licking and grooming. So if a rat, mother, licks and grooms rat pups. That is good mothering for a rat. If she doesn't, you know, low level of licking and grooming, uh, that, that leads to, it's been known, there have been associations. Well, what she did, what, what Sarantia Champagne did, was actually look at the methylation of the gene. This is kind of an index of the differential methylation. And so what she finds is that at birth, the, the, the kid, the, mother, the offspring of licking, low licking and grooming dams and high licking and grooming dams are basically the same. That's if you look at the figure under birth. And then when you go out into life, what you find is the low licking and grooming mothers have a much differential methylation, much higher methylation, suppression of sort of gene products and so forth in the life cycle, and the low licking and high licking and grooming mothers much less. And these persist throughout the lifetime. So this is a sense in which adverse environments, so we have fragments of evidence. I don't want to predict we should go from the rat studies to passing a bill in Congress tomorrow. But it does suggest very strongly, and I'll show you something even more. I'll skip over this. But in the monkey studies, work by Suomi, it shows even more dramatically. So this is like looking at licking and grooming, and it's looking at behavior. Really, I, it's not the full genetic material. It's only a part of the mouse's brain. But there's a recent dramatic study by Sumi and his co-authors. And I've actually participated in that study uh, to an extent, and I, some of the modeling. And so what happened is if we look at, at, at putting monkeys into adverse environments, these are monkeys that are reared, pure reared environments versus mother reared environments. You can literally experimentally assign uh, parenting strategies. And then you can look at what the consequences are for the methylation of the gene and see it into adulthood. And so what happened is the peer reared monkeys, think of that as monkey poverty, are ones who exhibited expression of genes that involve more inflammation, 
all of these negative aspects in terms of adult health. So in terms of adult health attributes, serious limitations. Surrogate mothers, if you adopt them in, instead of having to just rear by themselves, surrogate mothers can partially reverse it. In the ordinary mother, you don't get this reversal at all. So I'll just show you. I don't know if you can see this graph very well. I guess you can't. I'm sorry. I made these shrunk more than I thought uh, uh, in, in the last few days. They, didn't, they shrank in my computer, I guess, on the way here. But the only thing you really need to see is you have three conditions where the mother is rearing, and that's the top, the surrogate, and the peer reared. And the different, this is a heat map, and it's showing differential methylation. So instead of just going through, the fact is you see very different methylation patterns. And these are full scans on the genome. This isn't just one gene. It's not just one part of the brain. It's not just the rat's hippocampus. This is the whole gene. And this recent study by Nini, Swumi, and Ziff show that basically early peer rearing is affecting close to 22 percent of the whole genetic material. It's not even known yet about what the full ramifications of that are. But child poverty plays a huge role. Okay, so what do we know about this? We also know from, again, from the, from the literature and psychology that there are critical and sensitive periods. I, I know a lot of people have talked about this before, and I got, take a graph from Charles Nelson and his co-author Thompson, Russell Thompson, and looking at, the, uh, at looking at what critical and sensitive periods are. These are periods for development of different traits. We know, for example, in the acquisition of the second language that learning a second language before age 11 is generally more efficient. You literally learn with a different part of your brain later on. So typically, it's very hard to acquire a second language without an accent after age, say, 10 to 13. We know in a lot of stages of development, there are, seri there are critical and sensitive periods where if we don't intervene, it makes a big difference. So let me, let, me, let me just refer you to that literature. It's a very important literature, but it's not fully developed. So in the sense that right now, I want to take it back to the human studies and take it back to the studies that are a little less biologically motivated. So the real question, and this is always the important question, is always from the point of view of economic analysis. We want to understand how easy is it to remediate the effect of early disadvantage. Now, why do I say that? It's, it's not that early factors matter. Early factors do matter. We know that. But the question is always going to be, well, from a purely economic standpoint, it's always better to postpone, right? If I can do the same thing at age 18, spend the same money at 18 than at age one. I can actually spend more money at 18 because I put the money in the bank. So economically, it's always a better thing to, to wait. Everything else the same. But the real question is how costly is it to delay? And that gets us back to the question of critical and sensitive periods. And what do we know about the optimal time for interventions? So let me, uh, let me show you some, some evidence. This is now going to be an excursion into some of the early childhood literature. I mentioned already of the Perry program. Let me show you some evidence. The Perry program was a program that's probably the best studied of all these programs. Not the best program, and maybe in, the, in 10 years from now, not necessarily the best studied, but, uh, but right now, it's, the kids are 40 years of age. People were randomly assigned into treatments of, of, of uh, control and treatment conditions, and they were followed for 40 years. All of these kids were disadvantaged African-American children. They were all in one town west of Detroit, very poor town. Uh, very, uh, very deprived area, uh, generally, a few neighborhoods that are good, but this was not a good area in terms of the affluence. This was all in the period 1962 to 1967. The treatment in this program was fairly modest. It basically consists of two and a half hours of classroom instruction. And the instruction is interesting, because what was done was you weren't reading, you weren't teaching the alphabet to these kids, although there are alphabets, I've been to the classroom, it's pretty much the same, and you can see the alphabet all around the room. Uh, it's there, but what was actually done is what they call the plan-do-review sequence. So kids came in each day, they defined tasks, they finished the task, they stayed with the task, remember the perseverance, the self-control, and then they reviewed the task. They also worked with each other, and there was some, some training aspect of social skills. There was also a family visit. Parents were actually visited once a week by the, uh, uh, in 90 minutes each week by the teacher, and various aspects about the training of the teacher, a training of the uh, school, what the school was doing, were instructed. Okay, so what's amazing about this is that this program, uh, these people have been followed for 40 years, and they're all actually turning 50, so there's a plan to follow them to age 50. Now, this is the important part, taking me back to the beginning of this talk. Perry did not raise IQ, did not. What it did do is it raised the non-cognitive skills, and it was exactly what, that wasn't even what they were looking for in the 1960s. The whole emphasis at that period was raising IQ. 
So in the late 60s, some of you will remember this Westinghouse report that was put out by, by on, on, on the uh, Head Start program, and the argument was a failure of a program. Couldn't possibly work. The reason is, is that treatment and control groups, they had a big surge in their IQ, and then they faded out, so Head Start couldn't work. So uh, that, was the, that was the argument. Well, just like Head Start, Perry did not raise the IQ. It had an initial surge. I'll show you the graph. The treatment group in the Perry program, they were all enrolled at age three. These kids were subnormal IQ. They were chosen to be subnormal IQ. They were all disadvantaged kids, so they were chosen to have low IQs. The kids had an average of 80 coming into the program. During the program, just like Head Start, big surge in the IQ, and then it dwindled down to the average of 85. The control group basically started at the same level, didn't experience the same surge, but by age 10, the treatment and control groups are basically the same. No effect on IQ. So if you evaluate American policy by IQ effects, this is a miserable failure. And yet, Perry had a huge effect. I'm just going to show you the results for males. This is a reanalysis that we did. So we can actually decompose. So all of these effects, I don't know if you can see them. Uh, I can read them off. The very first one is an achievement test. It's California achievement test at age 14. The second one is employment at 19. Monthly income at 27. Uh, if you look at people participation on welfare, arrests, which is a huge dimension. So in this, uh, this reanalysis of the Perry preschool program, we looked at the cost-benefit calculations. We found very high uh, rates of return. A lot of the analysis group is here right now. So we can decompose the effect and say, how much of this had to do with the boost, extra boost in cognition that was due to, uh, due to the Perry program? Well, for males, there wasn't. There's a slight difference there, but it's not statistically significant. So a slight effect on, on the achievement test, but not much. If you ask how much of the treatment effect, this is just the percentage of the total treatment effect. All of these treatment effects are statistically significant. And the rate of return is statistically significant. So I'm not giving you just numbers at random. And, and we do adjust for multiple hypothesis testing. So these are significant tests. These are things that test for uh, uh, multiple uh, testing procedures. So this gets rid of cherry picking of selective results. But for example, if you look down here at this bottom slide, this, this slide here, what you'll see is that close to more than 70% of the treatment effect associated with uh, reduced crime at age 40, total costs associated with crime came because of the boost in non-cognitive traits. We have direct measurements of those traits. We can then ask how much of these direct measurements translate into explaining the, the achievement effect. So this is just the mediating analysis and so forth. And we look at other measures of non-cognitive traits, that there's still some additional component as well. So even there, the rest of it is not fully explained. We're not explaining all the treatment effect. But still, 70% isn't bad of a pure treatment effect. And even in the worst cases on welfare participation, we're getting 20, 25 percent. But the measured cognitive and non-cognitive factors, cognitive factors are playing a fairly minimal role. That's the rest, by the way. Okay, so what am I saying? I, I'm taking too long, maybe, but what, what am I saying? Well, what I want to try to emphasize, and I think the center here is focusing on, I talked to a lot of people, I know that, uh, that Ken is talking a lot about this in adolescent interventions, but there are others as well, is the developmental focus. And so what we want to try to do in our work is to move beyond this kind of level of just looking at treatment effects. I already did a little bit already in decomposing it. But we want to think about the basic principles that underlie what these programs do. So the, the danger with these programs is we do an experimental evaluation, say, see, this program worked. And we say, OK, here's another program, and this program worked. We look at a bunch of treatment effects. Typically, we don't even look at the rates of return. So we don't even compare them, rates of return. And we don't understand why one program worked better than another, or what, what was it that was really going on. So what we're trying to do is understand how these programs and how families together, these programs are just supplements to the family. These are nothing more than supplemental parenting programs, compensating for adversity in American family life. So we want to understand through what channels do these operate, that both the family effects, the non-experimental family studies, and the treatment effects, personality, cognition, and health. And so to do this, I, I realize now I'm running afoul of uh, Hawking's rule. Hawking said you lose, you lose half your audience for each equation. <laughs> now technically, this isn't an equation, so you still should be here. <laughs> but this is, so I hope you don't, I, I'm near the end anyway. So. Uh, but what this is showing is just a basic comment. So this is trying to codify Thomas Edison and so forth. It's basically saying, 
that outcomes, that's what Y stands for. It can be a bunch of things. It could be an achievement test score. It could be crime. It could be how well the individual did on a test. It could be how well a person did in the workplace, how well a person fixed a gun in the military. There are a number of things. You can think of J as a large number of attributes. And the basic theory, of course, in economics is one of comparative advantage, and it's one where individual outcomes are determined by capacities and by the incentives to use the capacities. So again, if we look at crime, we're not going to say just criminally prone people, you know, some thetas are there and, and people commit the same amount of crime. I suspect we would all be happy to steal a billion dollars if we could do it without ever being caught. Uh, so that's the incentive uh, environment. So, uh, so really, we're, none of us are completely moral. But the point is, is that, is that we want, so I want to understand, and the way to organize this evidence is to think of both the family studies and the experimental studies as affecting theta as it's measured in different control, different environments. And those controlling for environments is a huge literature. But the second ingredient is this dynamics of skill formation. So what it's saying is these capacities, these thetas, are self-productive, so that's where skill begets skill. It's where investment plays a role and where parental environments, even independent of environments, play a role, and peer effects and other larger groups. The distinction in the last two arguments isn't so, isn't so uh, important. So the central question, though, so, so here's the idea. Capacities matter. Capacities affect a lot of decisions. How we decide to specialize in life, you know, comparative advantage is not just something in international trade. It's our life. I mean, we all know, we all tried probably to be great musicians great athletes, great this, and we all settled into our mediocre current status as a result of finding out our comparative advantage was there. We're not going to be Einstein's, but we are going to have, uh, we are going to be relatively good. So that's what, the, that's what that first equation is saying. And the second equation is saying that we can improve those capacities. And that's the new part. Because there's a huge literature. I could give you specialized literature. There's a literature in criminology that basically talks about types that appear early on in life and you're like rocket ships born into your, over your whole life. And yet I would argue, no, that second argument and the third argument of those functions play a very important role. Environments can mediate what initial endowments are. But we need to understand that. I'll show you a little bit of evidence on that and then shut up. So, the, so what are the central questions? The central question is, for public policy, what's the most efficient way to intervene? So these capacities matter. I've tried to show you some of the evidence on that. There's a large and growing body of evidence. It's cognitive non-cognitive and health components. But on top of that, there's also a, 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 a sense that these matter and that they can be manipulated. So we can now start understanding how families and the Perry program and the Abbasidarian program compete on the same footing. We can literally show, okay, an enriched family environment is improving social and emotional skills by this amount. So some preliminary calculations that Flavio Cunha and I made a few years ago basically said that Perry if you took our technology function, was basically like moving a disadvantaged kid from the bottom decile of the endowment of the family investment distribution to about the 70th percentile. So you're really moving it up. Not, not changing the parental characteristics, just doing raw investment, just doing that. So you can, you can codify that. And then you can understand which dimensions and in which capacities and where in the life cycle investments are optimally placed. So uh, this kind of framework is a guide, uh, Gabriella Conti's here, and we're, we're integrating this with health and many other dimensions. But if you look, for example, at this, the goal is to always understand how these early capacities are formed and how at these various stages, the prenatal, birth, early childhood, and late adulthood, we get the dynamics of the skill formation process, how investment is cross-fertilizing. So uh, maybe uh, I should wind down with making a few remarks to simply say this schemata has oh, people are falling asleep already because it's uh, the, the equations are there they haven't left yet that's nice but uh, but let me let me let me just conclude so so the idea is to really try to understand the developmental focus on capacities and to, we, we we can quantify these and so let me uh, let me just summarize what are two polar cases in the economics literature and the public policy literature now so I won't put up any equations or I'll flash by them the first equation that really dominates, the first view of human skill, and I think this was the Lyndon Johnson view of skill, this was an optimistic view of skill, was that we can invest more or less at any age and we can make good. So remember the war on poverty wasn't just head start. It wasn't just, it was like 40 and 50 year old steel workers who were disadvantaged. It was illiterates living in Appalachia and a whole spectrum of people. 
And so that was an idea that economists would call perfect substitution. At some point, you can compensate. Might be more costly later on, but you can do it. The opposite case is the case which we can, you can think of as the left shoe, right shoe technology. The economists call it Leonti of technology. It's basically saying that you, you need a left shoe and you need a right shoe both to walk. If you just have one, it's much harder to walk. So, so the idea would be that if in the early years you receive no, no investment, in the later years, no investment that you make later on can compensate. So if you don't get the minimal investment early on, later on you can't do anything. That's a very bleak view. You can actually estimate. You can quantify that. I won't show you the estimates, but we have a series of estimates of how much you can remediate early with late. And the literature, it's, not, it's certainly not perfect substitute. It is not. We do find that the early investment has a much higher rate of return, and the cost of remediating is high later on, especially for cognitive traits. It turns out the substitutability across the life cycle for non-cognitive traits is typically, uh, it doesn't change that much. You can remediate early and late for non-cognitive traits, but for cognitive traits, it gets to be much harder. But so the, where do we land in this spectrum? It's much closer to this left shoe, right shoe technology than it is to the perfect substitution. And what does that technology say? It says you can't remediate later on for early disadvantage. If you have a low level of skill later on, don't have the base, it's very hard to remediate later on. But it also says, and this is your point, that if you don't do later on, you're not going to get any effect from the early on. So it really is saying you need complementary investment over the whole life cycle. The technical term is complementarity. So we can measure that. So let me skip past all this. This is what I said in words. And uh, let me just, uh, let me just, so I'm going to skip all this. And, and, and conclude, actually. I should conclude because I'm over my time. So if you, we can, out of this technology, we actually had, literally this was a freehand graph, and this still is a freehand graph, but it's actually rooted in, in some data that we have. It's an implication of the technology with Cunha. And basically what we can say is, suppose you imagine the hypothetical experiment. I invest a dollar in the life of a child, each day in the life of the child, one dollar. If I do that, give everybody at least something. Now I ask, having done that, Say, one, say, say a dollar each year, I now ask, where should the next dollar go? Where's the marginal return the highest? And the marginal return turns out to be highest for the earliest years. Why? Because of the self-productivity. I race through that argument, but because the skill begets skill, what happens is an early investment makes it much easier for later investment. So when, when the governor and, and the panelists were talking about trying to root this into education, this has a direct tangible output. You motivate children early on, and you get them directed, and you get them highly motivated, and, and, and you, you can avoid a lot of the special burdens that are placed on the school system, special education, and a lot of the difficulties that are associated with special education. And so immediately you get a higher, but that translates into a higher return. Why? Because you save those costs, and you make the child more investable later in the life of the child. And so that's the notion, that you really get a dynamics. Uh, it's a multiplier, if you will, not a Keynesian multiplier, but a life cycle multiplier where you're actually showing that the investment, because it's raising the productivity of future investments, is making it easier to invest in the child, less costly because you don't have to remediate, and producing a very high rate of return. And so you find this pattern, which is the early years have a very high rate of return, the later years very low rate of return. Not zero, though, but nonetheless lower. Now, this is, a, this is what economists would call an out-of-equilibrium relationship. So what the optimal policy would be to invest so that the rate of return is the same at all ages. But if you look at the data, like Seung's data and other data, where you actually find what the investment patterns are, for disadvantaged kids in the earliest years, you see the greatest deprivation. So the pattern of optimal investment is, and for the most advantaged kids, they're getting a lot of, they're, maybe they're getting smothered. You can refer to other Woody Allen movies besides Zelig about uh, mothering and so forth. I don't know if you want to hear some public policy discussions, but there, there's some practical issues which I want to conclude. So let me just talk about this because I think it relates to some of the discussion of the panel. There are practical issues. This is an area that's in flux. I'm obviously excited by it. I'm very excited because I see a symbiosis of economics, psychology, neuroscience, epidemiology, a lot of interesting trends, a lot of work still to be done. I think we, we have a lot of open questions. Whom should we target and what is the best program? and who should provide the programs, who should pay for them, and what would be the compliance. So let me just talk very briefly. All the studies that have been done to date have shown very high returns to disadvantaged people. And 
it raises the question of what the proper measure of disadvantage is. I don't think it's poverty, like we traditionally measure it. I think it has much more to do with measures of disadvantage in the early family life related to parenting and the resources given to the child. Quality of parenting plays a very key role. There was an experiment done, a natural experiment, if you will, in an Indian reservation in Connecticut about 15 or 20 years ago. And what happened was that uh, an Indian tribe opened a casino. This tribe had been the subject of many, many studies by sociologists and uh, anthropologists, and this tribe was destitute, very poor. Suddenly, you get, they, they were able to open a casino, and they became very rich. And meanwhile, the anthropologists, sociologists had been studying child welfare. And so they could actually take before and after measures. The casino was open. Well, they found improvement overall in child measures. But then they started looking more closely. And they had been measuring child parenting practices. Where they found the improvements were in those families where there seemed to be a definite improvement or change in the parenting style that came from the increased wealth. So the structure then was, was, was neat. So it wasn't just the money, because the parents all got shares equally. It was really the way parenting was doing. So, that's at least a hint. So I think that's why certain cultural groups and have, have, been, have been more successful even in the face of adversity and poverty. And we know that within any, any ethnic uh, cultural group, you find very sharp differences, that very poor people can do extremely well in raising the children, simply the quality of the parenting, how well the mother sticks. So what's the program? I'm not going to advocate one particular program, sorry, uh, the Abbasidarian group. Uh, but these are all promising. I mean, there are a lot of very interesting programs. They, they're being evaluated now into the adult years, and that plays a huge role in understanding what rates of return are. We know that what I would argue from the Perry evidence, and I would argue will show up in other cases, that programs that are essentially building character and motivation, not just focusing on that cognition, not just focusing on verbal skill, are ones that are going to last. But we need to sort through this list much more finely. There's a danger here of people saying, okay, this program worked. The one thing we do know is that there are a lot of other possibilities out there. So we need a really an experimental approach here. We really need to be thinking, yes, we need to evaluate what was tried. We need to know what the mechanisms were. But we also need to think more broadly. We just shouldn't think about replicating one program that's had some measure of success and thinking that's going to work. Now the question is, and this is a big issue, and this is something that I don't think was discussed adequately in the panel today. So I'll get my, my two minutes in. Uh, and that is who should provide the programs. There's been a general feeling that these are governmentally supplied programs. But that's not true. That should not be true. For many reasons, it shouldn't be true. First of all, one of the biggest sources of opposition is the question about these early programs intruding into early family life. I mean, there's a reason why programs are not adopted, a lot of these programs. Because when you're taking zero to three-year-old kids, and you're taking kids away from their parents, and you're saying, now I'm going to let somebody from another group start raising my kid or inculcating different values, you're really challenging a basic premise of American and most societies. So I think you need to design programs that understand that. You really need to respect that. So you need to respect cultural diversity. And I think you need to think about bringing in a lot of actors in this program, precisely not only because it would respect in a way that maybe a single government. You know, the problem with a lot of government programs is it's forced towards uniformity. There's a sense of treating everybody alike. But here's a case where if different ethnic and religious groups have different values, they should. I mean, I, mean there, there's, I can give you scenarios that are quite bizarre where you, know, you might train people in certain ways that you may not like and others may not like. But nonetheless, I think the structure should be that we bring in people, not only because it will respect the sanctity of the family and not the cultural diversity is. Somebody would mention a, a discussion in, in Holland. You, some of you were there in Holland. But there was also an issue in, in Holland that, the, again, the Dutch were very anxious to have a universal pre-K program, right, and, and to make it fair and not to adapt in a very culturally sensitive way to the North African population. So kids came in. They were actually teaching in Dutch some of these programs, not really respecting the life. So there's that. And then there's the other component, which is funds. At this point in time, we really do have shortages of government funding, and we need to try to bring in support. Then the question is, should they be universal or not? And so my, my viewpoint is fine. Make them universal, but have a sliding fee schedule. There's, and so if some, there's always this fear of stigmatization. It's OK, so make them universal. Everybody can come to Head Start or Enriched Head Start, but then there'll be a, a tax by income. That could be arranged privately or through the IRS or something. So I think what you really want to do is, is I don't think the universality issue is such a deep issue. 
And I do think that with the time of limited resources, as an economist, I cannot in good conscience say we should spend money on what economists would call deadweight loss, namely taking the kids from affluent parts of Durham or uh, the suburbs of Chicago and giving them free childcare when they already have a lot of resources and if anything, uh, they may, 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 may over-parent over their children. And then there's the question of uh, issues of compliance. And, and th this really gets back to the family values question. And that is a lot of successful programs change the values. That runs counter to the values of parents. And we should just respect, put it out on the table. There may be serious challenges. This is something that many people don't like to, uh, to admit. But I think that's the serious tension that's out there. I gave a talk on this in Edinburgh a couple of years ago. And I remember I mentioned a program called Big Brother, Big Sister, which is an adolescent intervention program. And the newspaper headline the next day says, Chicago economist advocates big brother coming into the household. <laughs> but that's the fear. That's the fear that's out there. And there really is. This is a very delicate issue. You are dealing with the family. These, this is not just a template. You have, to, you have to package these in a way. So let me summarize. A lot of current social problems, I think, have their roots and abilities. There are other factors as well. So I mentioned crime. You know, I'm not saying that the only reason why there's an education deficit is because of abilities, but I'm saying if I had to put a first order accounting, that would be the first order. The ability deficits open up early, they produce inequality, and they also reduce uh, productivity. And a lot of evidence shows that uh, these interventions play, there are critical and sensitive periods. Uh, and this is associated with some very stern neurological bases, animal and human studies, which I reviewed. And what we found is that early investment is generally more productive. And it's because of what we've come to understand is the biology and psychology, the, the evolution of the brain, and the evolution of how skills are created. These critical and sensitive periods are, are documented and increasingly getting documented. So if we construct an optimal portfolio, it's generally weighted towards the early years, and because the early investments create a base for later investments. And so this leads to the question of should we invest in early versus late? Well, uh, the advantage versus disadvantage, I think we want to look at the disadvantaged, uh, primarily getting the subsidy anyway. But in anything, we have to be careful and know that the knowledge base needs to be expanded. This is kind of a trite saying that every academic talk ends with. But in this area, it's particularly strong because I worry about the rush. I think when the leaders in early childhood get together and meet, when they're honest with each other, they say, we don't really know what the best policy is. We know, that we know hints of certain things. That's why it's important not to say, Here's the treatment effect, but why did the treatment effect work? And what, what did we learn from it? I think what we learned from it was social and emotional skills. I think what we're going to learn from it in the future, and we really haven't looked at it enough, is health. Health, early health is going to play a big role. But a lot of the early intervention programs didn't even think about health. They didn't even, so the Perry study, you can't even get the body mass index of the Perry people at age 40. That, that was how unimportant the, anti, the, 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 the body measurements were. So that's the point. So what we've learned then is that, yes, Remediation can work if we don't do investment early on, but it actually is much less effective, and uh, it's costly. We should work in improving it, but it nonetheless is costly. And so I think that social policy really should be redirected. So if you think of how we spend our budgets, so you're talking about you know, spending money on the, on the over 60 set as opposed to the under 5 set, well, I would certainly say the disadvantaged under 5 set should receive a lot more attention. But it should receive attention in a kind of a way guided by these principles, but with knowledge that we don't really have a best program yet. And that I very much worry about people rushing out and saying, well, I like this, or I read this particular graphic account of my program, or I read the website of this program or that. There's a danger in that, because there is a lot to be known still. But I think the contours are there. And I think that's the exciting part of it. So, there's some of this, some of this is, this website I didn't create myself, but if you want to, you can download some of this material, and it actually does have a lot of documents associated with the, with the tech, scientific papers that support it. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope. Sure, you want, to, you want to take it? So I guess I get to be moderator, so I can stop Hutz from asking any questions. <laughs> No, seriously, I'd be happy to take questions. I much prefer. I went on too long, I realize, but yes. What's that? Yeah, 
Well, no, I mean, there's certainly evidence that suggests that cognitive traits are more highly valued. I mean, the environment is much less of a, a blue-collar manual labor environment. So there's definitely some strong uh, evidence that suggests that the technology changes the price of skills. There have been surprisingly hard to actually isolate a huge change that's just related to return to cognitive ability. And people are working on it, but there seems to be some indication. Murnane and Willett and Levy have actually done some work on that. So there's some evidence that technology is moving towards a more cognitively, and that's commonsensical. You look at the use of computers and look at the use of, uh, of, of the technology that's using higher skills. Yes? Yes, I, I race through that. So actually, the estimates of the technology are really showing the following, that a higher level of non-cognitive skill actually makes it easier for investment in cognitive skills. So if you actually would, so this is commonsensical. Putting it, forgetting the, the language, if you just put in the, in the, in the common sense, it's saying if the kids are motivated to learn and you make learning investments in them, they're going to learn more. That's what I just said in a common sense term. And, and yes, there's evidence for that. Interestingly, though, in the, some of the estimates with Flavio, there wasn't the reverse effect, that the cognitive components didn't seem to help that much in promoting non-cognitive. We don't know what the estimates are for health. I mean, that's to be determined. We're, we're still estimating those technologies. But, so that's the sense in which higher level of cognitive, non-cognitive skills promotes the base for learning. And then there's a the self-productivity effect. So literally, there's a cross effect that higher cognitive skills would promote the growth of higher levels of non-cognitive skills directly. But the really strong effect is through this en enhancement of investment. Oh, yes? The eternal question about public policy. <laughs> the eternal question. I, I would say this, though. We have some, I, again, it's a rough guide. I mean, you could formalize this. There are a lot of interesting papers that do just that. But the short and intuitive answer is, basically, I think now, if you look at the way we spend our budgets, we're spending a lot of money still on job training programs. You, so the question about, say, where do we get the additional resources to do this? If we simply applied cost-benefit analysis to programs currently in place, you know, th there was a cost-benefit analysis done on the Job Corps. The, the, it, job Corps raised the earnings of participants by $3 a year with a standard error of $500. It had no, had no effect. And so we could spend the Job Corps money on other things. By the way, Job Corps was producing the GDs I mentioned earlier, but even, even now I bet it's not that good. So you can redistribute the budget. You should really sensibly understand that this this curve that I was showing you actually I think is real. This is a curve which indicates how much priority should be, where you should relatively spend more of your money relative to less. So in that sense, I would say that for guidance of where the policy comes from, when you get to the specific issue, should it be this particular program or that, I'm very hesitant to say that, precisely because I think it's, we don't really know. I mean, I think to me it was a surprise that Perry was operating mainly through non-cognitive traits. And what I found amazingly, this is something, a recent discovery. This is, I was meeting with the people, there's a program that was written up in the New York Times a few months ago called Tools of the Mind. It was teaching self-control to children. It turned out the Tools of the Mind, there's a famous Russian psychologist named Vyatgatsky, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. But basically, that was the inspiration for Tools of the Mind. Then I started realizing that Tools of the Mind had been implemented in some form or another in the Perry program. Even though they didn't use that language in the 60s, they had implemented a version of Tools of the Mind, a crude version. So I actually sent the Perry Protocols to the Tools of the Mind people. And there was a eureka moment. They, they actually had an evaluation of their program about 40 years out. But it, it's those kinds of, con so, so in other words, instead of thinking of just vocabulary, there are whole groups of people saying we must put in phonics or must do that. I would say that the, that the missing gap in a lot of the thinking is understanding. So I did talk to your former governor at length. I gave him part of these slides. And I said, you know, you really have to think about non-cognitive traits. And at least as he left this platform, he seemed to be convinced. We'll see if he's, the next time you hear him, he may not have heard a thing, but we'll see. But, but the fact of the matter is that that's the kind, those are the kinds of measures. But to, to say it more precisely, I worry about it. And so, and, and to engage the parents. So it seems like any successful program is going to engage the parents. Because the one thing we know about education is that successful schooling programs generally have parents helping 
So, you know, the Coleman report showed that most of the variability across schools, much of the variability anyway, was not caused by the schooling quality that Coleman measured. It was actually caused by the parents, the, the, the parental environment. So family factors, not schooling factors, matter. So that's, that's, a, that's not going to help you in the immediate answer. Maybe some other people can. Elizabeth, you can, you can give some advice. Uh, you can, I'm more than happy to listen to that. But, but I think that but there is always that policy, because we never make policies for full information. And we never have, and we never will. But I, on the other hand, I think we don't have to do repeat some of the mistakes of the war on poverty. I don't think we can think we can just do a scattershot program across all stages of the life cycle and think that's going to work. I think even within childhood, we want to target much more of the early years than we do now. And then within that, a much greater emphasis on these social and emotional skills. Okay, now, yes, yeah, Seth. <laughs> Every instinct I have makes me think that you're right and, and the family's playing a key role in, in the uh, production of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. But the, but the time series evidence, you know, there's been a, quite a decline in crime, and there's, there's been quite a decline in teenage childbearing right. over the last 10 years. And at the same time, there's been a Correct. rise in the number of single uh, families. Correct. There may have been a change in the quality of marriages with the sorting from changing divorce laws. So I, I, do you have any comment on the, on the time series evidence itself wouldn't suggest? No, I'm worried about that. And actually, Asung is looking at exactly that question, asking how much... Because you see that when you look at the change in the family life, you have to recognize that there are multiple dimensions. So families are now richer, and, and they're actually more educated than they were. That's all a good plus. But at the same time, uh, families are worse in the sense of these dimensions. So that should contribute to negative outcomes. But in the particular measure of crime, I think we have to look at measures above and beyond just this question of cognitive and non-cognitive skills. So I'm not saying that's the full story. And it clearly runs contrary to the kind of time series evidence, what you're saying. So in other words, if I were to say, does this story explain the, the, ri the decline in the crime rate in the last 15 years? I'd say certainly abortion uh, doesn't, and, but I'd also say that uh, these non-cognitive skills and, and the family environment seem not to either. So uh, in that sense, it looks like an improvement. On the other hand, um, there are a lot of other measures, right? We've heard some statistics. If you look, for example, what seems to be a growing underclass, so maybe these kids aren't committing the same level of crime, but you are finding higher levels of kind of this group. This is not just true in the US, but the UK, a greater fraction of kids who are born, who are basically neither employed nor going to school in their teenage years. That's been increasing. So maybe the severity of the violence, but by many mentions, you know, the skinheads and the, this two-class society business actually is, is a real business. But I, I completely agree with what you're saying, and you can't just take the time series. It would, it would run against it. If I were just to say, take what I've said today, and that's going to explain the decline in the and the crime rate, no, American families have probably gotten worse. I could give you kind of a cheap story and say, well, see, education levels went up. You know, if I just were to look at one thing at a time and just look at your crime, I'd say, yeah, well, the education levels have gone up. Maybe that more than compensates for the adverse family for crime. Maybe it's just that particular trait. I don't know the answer. I don't know the sharp answer, but it's a good question. What's your answer? Why is it? No, seriously, what, what's the reason why the crime rate has declined? That's a huge mystery, right? Teenage childbearing is declining at the same time. It's declining time. too. So that, exactly. That's sort of interesting. Russ. Um, no, no, and a lot of the. But at I the mean, same I think time, sorting may have had an issue. Yeah, no, but we know contraception, sorting, and so forth. There, there certainly it seems to be, but there are other dimensions by which you can say we're getting to a more deviant society, right? And that we're getting a, a growing underclass and more high school dropouts and so forth. So that's a good, that's a really great question, and I wish I had a better answer for it. But I mean, there was a book recently written. I've forgotten the name of this guy. He was looking at the determinants of uh, the decline in crime, and uh, you know, basically said we still don't have a good explanation for that. And there isn't one. Maybe you think of one. Anybody have one? I'd be happy to surrender the phone and microphone and and, and listen. Yes. Oh. Yes. No. Look, you're talking about classroom productivity right away. You're talking a big burden on schools is things like uh, special students, categories. You're talking about remediation. You're talking about aggression. You're talking about a whole series of chains, even in the public schools, even in the first few years outside of public schools. So see, one of the Perry studies, one of the th studies we used was you looked at teacher ratings about aggressive behavior 
in the first and second grade, you actually found that was declining dramatically between the treatment and control groups, and for males and females, both. It was a real thing. The, the amazing thing about these PERI results is it was a very small sample. You're talking a sample sizes of uh, 60 for each gender group, 30 treatment, 30 control. You're still finding strong, significant results, even after adjusting for pre-testing. So, so I would say they do show up. Now, the full benefit won't show up for 40 years. And so there was a simulation done recently at the Brookings Institution. Sawhill and um, Dickens had a paper where they actually did the calculation. And they were showing, of course, that the big problem with early childhood investments tended to be the money was spent early on and the, and the, the big returns came later on, and that's true. But if you think about a longer term steady state, then you're gonna get very high returns. But yes, there is, so you will get some returns, but the full returns will come later. 